Welcome to my sixth and final LaTeX tutorial on slide and poster presentations using the Beamer class. With the aid of the Beamer class, LaTeX can be used to typeset both slide presentations and large format posters to be used in poster sessions at conferences. For both formats, your document will need to load the Beamer class and its preamble. If you're creating a poster, you will also need to load the Beamer poster package in the preamble. The purpose of this tutorial is to walk you through the fundamentals of formatting both slide presentations and posters using the Beamer class, as well as to showcase some of the additional functionality the Beamer class will give you for your documents. We'll begin this tutorial with an overview of how to format slide presentations using the Beamer class. There's several things that should appear in the preamble of a Beamer presentation document. First of all, you'll need to declare the document class to be Beamer with the document class Beamer statement. Beamer presentations can be themed. You can select your theme with the use theme command and it goes in the preamble as well. I personally like the Warsaw theme, but there are many to choose from. If you do a little bit of searching on the web, you'll find more than one really comprehensive gallery of the available themes for use in the Beamer class. I'll put a link to one in the video description. You can adjust the colors of your theme as well, and you'd use the use color theme command in the preamble. Just as an example of what this might look like, I use use color theme RGB equals 85075 with structure uh, for the Beamer presentation that you're currently watching. Finally, you can add a title, an author, an institution, and a date as usual, the, the ordinary components of the front matter of your document, and that would still go in the preamble. What's going to be different in these Beamer presentations is that that information will be rendered on its own slide, its own title frame, and you will create it, you'll cause it to be rendered using a title page command instead of the usual make title command that we're used to using in our ordinary LaTeX documents. We'll see some more of that in the slides to come. A Beamer presentation is organized in slides called frames and they're encapsulated within the begin frame and the end frame command. So frame is an environment. But you should also consider grouping your frames into structural units throughout your document. The first structural unit is really going to be your title page or your title frame. And so right after begin document, you'll want to create a frame that its sole purpose is to house your title and your front matter information. So it will look just like this, begin frame slash title frame to render the, the front matter information from your preamble and end frame. Then you can start using section commands and subsection commands to break your presentation into logical units. You'll issue these in between the frame environments of your, of, of your presentation. In addition to simply giving you some organization, some topical organization for your presentation, your sections and subsections will appear at the top of your presentation in a navigation bar. And this, this bar is actually clickable. Um, you, you can move from section to section by clicking these links, and then within each section, you can also navigate to your subsections. So that's one of the uses of sectioning in the presentations that are formatted using the Beamer class. Each frame can also have an optional title. So this is the frame title for our current frame, Organizational Structure, and in the Warsaw class it's, it's formatted in the way that you see with this dark color background and light text foreground. You render it on your frame using the frame title command, and then you just pass whatever the title, you, whatever you want the title to be into the mandatory argument, the mandatory input argument of frame title. So as a summary of what a very simple Beamer document might look like, well, it's going to begin with the document class statement, 
will have some theme information that will supply. It's not mandatory, but you can do it. Um, and then the front matter, a title and an author in this example. And then the body of the presentation begins with begin document, and that's closed at the end of the presentation. We've got a title frame, and then a section, an introductory section. That's going to have a frame in it with a title that says introductory section, and I just have some, some simple text on that frame, and that's it. So that would be a very short, very boring two-slide presentation. Well, we'll explore a much more complex example soon, but we need to look at some additional um, features that are available to you through the Beamer class to be used in your slide presentations. And the first of those features are dynamic lists, which are a specific example of the, the broader idea of overlays. So overlays give you a way of creating the illusion of the sequential revelation of content within your frame. And you've been seeing me use this throughout these presentations. Periodically, I'll click the space bar as I'm working through my presentation, and suddenly a new bullet appears. That's an example of a dynamic list, which is an example of a kind of overlay. So in Beamer, any of the three varieties of lists can use overlay functionality. To take advantage of it, you're going to use item with this, in its simplest form, this less than plus minus greater than symbol appearing right after the item. So you're gonna replace ordinary items with this, this new item that we've never seen before in our ordinary documents. And that becomes a dynamic list item. It will be added as you page through your slide presentation. So that's what I mean when I say that that notation causes each item in your list to be added sequentially instead of all at once. So if you leave it off, you'll just have a slide that has all of your bulleted items appearing at once. You can also experiment, you can control when and how long the items in your list should appear as you're paging through your, your, your slides. So you should experiment when you're working with these dynamic lists yourself with replacing the plus minus notation inside the less than and greater than uh, brackets with a two minus or a three minus or a minus four or a three through four. Those will all control for when and how long each item in your list is going to appear on your frame. In particular, the two minus will cause your bulleted item to appear on the second slide in your sequence through the end, through the end of the list. Three minus will cause that bulleted item to appear on the third slide in the, in the sequence of slides through the end. Minus four will cause it to appear from the beginning of the sequence of you know, dynamic list slides up through the fourth slide. And three through four just does what it sounds like. It'll cause that bulleted item to appear in pages three through four of this you know, sequential list of, of, of bullets. There are other kinds of overlays that you can use that don't involve a list at all, and th those can be useful as well. There's an on-slide overlay that works a lot like item does, but again, it doesn't require a list. So with the on-slide command, you would put some control inside of the less than and greater than brackets that would you know, a plus minus is fine, but you could use the numerical controls as well to determine when whatever it is that you're trying to um, have appear and disappear on your page should be present and not. And then the content itself is what goes inside of the curly braces. And we'll see some examples of this in code as well, but we're just trying to lay down the, you know, the fundamental behavior here. There's a visible overlay and it specifies when content appears on the slide and it reserves space for what that for that content regardless of whether it's actually being displayed so your control notation that goes into visible is going to specify when your content should be visible or which slides in the sequence it should be visible for and then again the you know the content itself goes into the curly braces and it has a as a twin 
called invisible, and it simply specifies when the um, information that you're, you're trying to control should be hidden from view. And then all other times it will be visible. Both visible and invisible have another kind of behavior, another piece of behavior. It's always going to reserve space for the content that you're, you're trying to display or not display. So other content on your page will not get shifted around in order to make room for the visible and invisible content or to you know slide into its place when it's absent. It, it reserves its space and keeps its space regardless of whether you're showing it. And then finally, the only overlay specifies when the content's going to be shown on the slide, but it, it doesn't reserve space for the content. So it's going to insert your content in wherever you place it on your page and move the other content on your page around to accommodate it when you tell it to be visible. And then it's going to delete it and shift everything back when you tell it to be invisible. Most other LaTeX document elements can be placed in a Beamer frame with little or no modification, but there's a few things that you should probably consider before using it. Mathematical markup works as usual, but I do recommend using equation numbers sparingly, if at all. And the reason for that is that there's really no point to referring to an equation by number if it appears several frames before or after the frame that you're referring it to it from. Your audience can't see it, so that equation number is going to mean very little to them. So the only time I ever use equation numbers in these presentations is if I'm trying to, if maybe if I've got multiple equations on one slide and I'm trying to refer to them by number while I'm displaying that slide. So it, it, it's a much more localized usage than you would maybe see in an ordinary LaTeX document. Graphics and tables work as usual as well, but you'll typically not want to make them into floats. And the reason for that is that you, it probably isn't even going to work with the Beamer class, but you really don't want LaTeX trying to place your tables and your figures wherever it thinks it ought to go based off of a geometric algorithm, you, you really want to have the total control over wh where they're located. And again, they're going to be a very localized feature that you're showing to your audience. You're going to be showing it on a particular slide and talking about it on that slide, and then it's going to be gone. So you want it to be where you intend it to be, and using a float is going to be counter to that. You might also find that you have a hard time fitting a figure or, or well, having a hard, you might have a hard time fitting a, a graphic coming from include graphics or a table into the space that's available on your slide. So use the scaling features for these, these objects wisely so that you can fit your content onto your slide. So use the scale optional argument for include graphics to make your, your, picture bigger or smaller so that it fits available space. And then often what I'll do is use a resize box command or a scale box command, which are available to you through the graphic X package as something that I can wrap around a tabular environment to shrink it up, down or, or blow it up to fit the available space. Bibliographies may also be added to Beamer presentations. And you can do so using either the embedded system or BibTeX. I typically place the bibliography style command in the preamble and the bibliography itself on the last frame of the presentation. I also typically use a non-numeric citation style, perhaps alpha or, or something else. If there are too many references to display on a frame, I'm going to give the bibliography frame an optional allow frame breaks input argument. And an example of how that might look is, is here on the slide where it's just it's an additional input argument that we give to the begin frame command. And what that's going to allow Beamer to do is that as you start getting to the end of a slide and you're, you still got more bibliographic references in your bibliography to add and render, it's going to break and make a new slide, 
make a new frame and continue adding the references to that. Otherwise, if you left allow frame breaks off, your bibliography is going to run right off the bottom of your slide and you won't see all of the entries. Another place where people run into problems when they're making their first Beamer presentations is when they try to include literal text in a frame. You're going to sometimes use packages like verbatim or all TT or the listings package to display literal transcripts of syntax from a programming language or maybe even the full transcript of a program source code. This works mostly in the same way that it does in ordinary documents, but and this is an easy thing to forget, but you've got to give the frame environment an optional argument of fragile, and that looks just like this. If you don't give it the optional input argument of fra fragile, you're going to get a really cryptic error that until you see it for a few times, you're, you're probably not going to have any idea what it means or what it's trying to tell you. So it, it, it can be kind of a difficult thing for beginners to debug. So just try to remember if you're going to include a source code transcript or even some, some basic commands from a programming language using one of these literal text packages that you need to make the frame that has that content in it fragile. Well, that's a fair amount of information on what's possible using the Beamer package as far as creating LaTeX presentations. But really to get into it, I think the best thing to do is to start working through a specific sample Beamer document, and that's what we'll do next. You can see that you know, the output formatted document looks structurally pretty similar to the slide presentations that we've been using as the core of all of our LaTeX tutorials. So if we look into the code, begins with a document class of Beamer. There's a number of packages that I've loaded so that I can add functionality to this, this slide presentation. Some of them you've seen before, others are new. AllTT and Verbatim are packages that I use for literal text. HyperRef allows me to uh, render clickable uh, URLs for web addresses. GraphicX and BookTabs, you've seen before, that's for creating images that go into our document and tables as well. The listings package and these related commands are just so that we can do a colored syntax highlighted source code transcript. So I'm going to have a bibliography in this example and it's going to use a bibliography style of alpha so that I can steer clear of using pure numerical citations and I'm using the Warsaw theme. One thing I like to do when I'm doing some of these slide presentations is I issue a Beamer template navigation symbols empty command. It's a mouthful. But what that means is that if I, if I leave that off, right down here at the bottom of the slides above the, the baseline bar, I left it off, you'd see that there are these very faint, somewhat hard to see, navigation buttons. And those can be handy because they're clickable buttons that allow you to move forward and backwards through the document. Um, they allow you to have a, you know, a play button so it will automatically skip through your slides, but I almost never used them. And what I found is that that eats up a little bit more vertical space on my slides that interferes sometimes with the text that I'm trying to put on my slides, and I don't like that. I tend to just use the space bar or the arrow keys to navigate through my slides when I'm giving a presentation like this one. So I just disable those navigation tools. And then finally, I've got some um, information about the, the colors that I, I want to use. And so this color scheme here, 80, 50, 75, gives me this sort of blue and black and gray themed. Um, 90, 70, and five, it turns out, gives me more of a red, black, and gray theme. Moving on through the preamble, there's a few more things. There's uh, all of the information that I want to put into the front matter, into my title page. So I've got a title, an author, an institute, and a date. In the institute section, which on my slides are, it says tools for research, there's a soft return, 
and or it's a hard unindented return rather a carriage return so tools for research a carriage return and then the mathematical science research launch pad so that's the institution information and then i do one more hard return and i put in an, a, a, um, a graphics of the uh, logo for the mathematical science research launch, launch pad so that is all part of the this that we're seeing here on the title frame that's all part of the institution uh, input information. And then I, I put an empty date because I just didn't want to have dates on, on these slide presentations. So that's a fairly complex set of front matter. Yours can, of course, be much simpler if you want it to be. So anyway, we move on and we begin the document and I've got a title frame. And um, that looks just like what we're seeing here. Begin frame, title page, end frame. And that's what renders this page right here. Next, I create an introduction, and we can see that one of the navigation bars, once we get to that introduction page, has the highlighted introduction section up there. So that is clickable. If you click on any of these, it will jump to the, that first page for each of those sections. Um, uh, but it also just gives us a way of organizing our frames into uh, like topic blocks. So in this introductory section, uh, there's not a whole lot that's going on. I've got a frame about lists, and that gives us an example to see what one of these dynamic lists looks like. And here's one right here. It looks just like itemize. The only difference is, is that I used that control notation of less than, plus, minus, greater than after each of the items. And now we can kind of see under the hood what that does, is that it basically creates a copy of that frame but the first time, it's only got the first bulleted item. The second copy has the first and second bulleted item. Third frame has the first, second, and third, you know, has, has all of them. So that, that's really how these overlays work, is that under the hood, LaTeX is really just creating copies of the underlying frame and then adding and removing content as you control using your, your overlay notation. This next frame illustrates the use of another type of overlay. And it's, in many ways, it's the simplest aside from the dynamic list overlays. And it's the onslide overlay. Let's see if, see if we can unpack the logic of how this frame is put together. First thing that you'll see is that there is some text on the frame that isn't in an overlay at all. So that's just ordinary frame text. It will be there regardless of what's going on with the other overlays. Then we've got an onslide command that says, let's take this line of text and let's show it for the second through the last of the slides in this overlay sequence. And so we'll see that as we move to the next copy of this overlay slide, we've got this line of text that appears. And then, there's another onslide environment that, that gives us one more line of text that should appear for the third through the, the last slides in this sequence of overlay slides. We can see once we get to the third copy of this particular frame, there it is. Here's another. And then that's it. There are no more slides in that sequence. So when we move on to the next page, well, it's this, it's this next frame. And it's another frame that, that illustrates a little bit more of a complex example of how overlays can work together. And it's actually a lot more complex. So there's a lot to see. So there is, again, some text that is going to be displayed no matter what. It's not controlled by any of the overlay environments. That's this that we're looking at. Other examples of overlays include the visible, invisible, and only overlays. And this begins to show you how those, those environments work. And remember that invisible and visible both reserve space for their content. So what they control is whether or not the content is going to be, like they're, they're named, visible or invisible. But when you make a piece of content invisible through the controls of those two commands, 
what's going to happen is the space that had formerly been occupied by that text or, or object, whatever it is that you wrapped the overlay environment around, is just going to become blank, but nothing else on the page is going to move. And so we can see that when we look at this first page, because we've got the text that's always there. And right here, the, we, if we look at the the text on our our um, our markup, there is a visible command and an invisible command, each with their own pieces of content. The visible command has some text that's going to be controlled to, to appear for slides two through the end, whereas the invisible command is going to have text that will be there for everything but the second and third page. So if I look at what's going on. We're on the first page in our sequence right now. So the one that is being controlled by visible, it's going to occupy this blank spot here, but it's not visible yet because we're not on page two yet. The invisible command has this text here that's right here. I'm invisible on pages two and three of the slide, but, but visible for all, all others. Well, that's why we're seeing it. We're on page one right now. Right. And then the only other one that's here that's working is the only slide, and that's the one that's visible. So that's going to appear before this visible and invisible block, but it's only going to appear on the fourth page in our sequence. So the other thing to remember about only is that it does not reserve space for its content. So this gap here, that gap is available for the visible command. It's just not visible yet. But once we move down to page four or frame four within the sequence, the content that is hidden here for the visible command and the content that's currently visible for the invisible command, that's all going to have to shift down to make room for what is being controlled by the only command. So it can get complex really fast, but let's, let's scroll through the pages and see what happens. So we're on page one. The visible content is not yet visible because we're not on page two. The invisible content is visible because, again, we're not on pages two or three. Now we move down. Now we're on page two, so the visible content is available, and it will be available through the end of this sequence. But because we're on page two, the invisible content is, is gone. We're on page three, so really nothing has changed. This is available, this is still gone. And then when we move to page four, really everything ought to be visible. And the stuff that came, was controlled by the only command appears. I'm only visible on the fourth page of this slide and beyond if more slides ever get. And since it didn't take up space until it's made visible, well, everything below it had to be shifted down and that's what's happened. So you can really control some complex dynamic behavior of the content on your frames by being clever and creative and doing a little bit of planning for working with these overlays. Well, we'll move on through our, our sample document here and just we can see what's possible with things like doing mathematical markup. And it's, it's pretty much the same as what happens in an ordinary LaTeX document. You know, you can have inline expressions inside of your dollar signs, standalone display math equations, and I use the slash bracket and slash close bracket for that. And of course, you can use the align environment for multi-line math as well. Notice I've not used any line numbers on these. I, as I said, I tend to be using my line numbers sparingly when I'm working with mathematical markup in my slide presentations. Well, we move on a little bit more and we've got an example. I already saw it coming with, with graphics. And this was just a picture of a scatter plot that I had rendered. And I used the include graphics command to bring it into my page. I experimented with a I used width instead of scale, but I, you know, I experimented with just a size parameter on this image to get this this picture scaled up to as big as it could be, so that my audience could view it pretty easily. 
but not so big that it goes beyond the margins of the, the frame. Uh, I also tend to wrap a center environment around include graphics, and that just ensures that it's going to be centered on the page instead of left justified. The next frame has a table example, which I just create using tabular. And again, I wrapped center around it. This one fit pretty well on the frame, but if you ever had a problem with it not fitting, you could wrap a scale box command around it. And there's, there's plenty of documentation on how to use scale box if you ever need to do that. I've got an example where I am trying to load source code and trying to describe literal text. And so, Here's an example where I'm using the verbatim environment, basically so that I could um, put some raw LaTeX source code on the frame for whatever reason. You know, maybe I'm trying to have a demonstration of how to use LaTeX. The verbatim package would allow me to do that because verbatim typically does let me put backslashes in and, and it will just render them instead of trying to interpret them as LaTeX commands. But the point here is to remember to use the fragile command if you're going to do things like that. S same thing would be true if I use the listings package or the LTT package to use any kind of this monospace literal, literal text that goes into the document. I'll demonstrate what happens if I forget fragile. I'll just cut it off of this frame and try to recompile. We'll see that I, I just get a cryptic error. It tells me that the paragraph has ended before next was complete to be read again. And the line number that it's giving me this error on, this time it's a little better than, than it often is. It's, it's giving me a line number at the end of the the frame that I forgot to put a fragile on. So th there's there's at least a little bit of a clue there, but it's it's not an error message that's overly descriptive of what the problem is. So it doesn't really tell you that you, know, you just forgot fragile. It's something that you just have to see a few times and know. So if I put it back, recompile, you know, the error goes away and I, I've got my document. And then the last thing that's in this sample slide presentation is how to work with bibliographies. And as I've said, you can use BibTeX or the embedded system. In this example, I've just used BibTeX and I've loaded the references bibliographic database that we've seen in the Bib BibTeX tutorial. And so the way I've built this is that I've created a frame. I've given it the allow frame breaks optional input argument. I gave it a frame title of references so that we'll know we're talking about a bibliography. And I use the bibliography command to load my references database. And I've got a copy of that bibtech file in the working directory that this, this sample document is, is coming out of. And then just because I didn't feel like going through my document and putting in a bunch of citations, I used I issued the no cite asterisk command here, and that's just a quick way to cause BibTeX to render every reference in your bibliographic database, and that's exactly what's happened here. And we can see what's happened is that it is it spanned two pages and then automatically or two frames and it automatically put a Roman numeral label on each of them. So we get a sense of many pages of references we've got to wade through. Not, not too many for this small BibTeX database. Well, that's it for our overview of this sample document of how to create a slide presentation with Beamer. You can get a copy of the LaTeX source code for this slide presentation, and it will be over at the Mathematical Science Research Launchpad companion page for this tutorial. There'll be a link to that page in the description of this video. Well, it's certainly true that slide presentations are one of the more important tools that you can have at your disposal for presenting your work to others. But if you've spent any time at scientific conferences, you've probably run into people who are giving poster presentations. And so that's an alternative format that you're probably going to want to learn to take advantage of. 
the Beamer class gives you a way that you can create your own large format posters for these poster sessions. It's still a Beamer document, but if you load the Beamer poster package into the preamble of that document, that will open up some additional tools that you can use for formatting these large format posters. A typical preamble for a Beamer poster document is really going to look like this up to some modifications. So your document class is still going to um, load the Beamer class. For these posters, at least if you're, you're in your final draft mode, you're going to want to give it these two optional arguments as well, final and T. Mode of presentation is another command that you'll issue in the, the uh, preamble. And then where we're actually going to load the Beamer poster package is with this next use package command. And there's a few optional arguments that's worth paying attention to. Um, orientation landscape is going to cause your poster to be wider than it is tall. If you want a tall and narrow poster, that's, that's possible as well. You just have to say orientation equals portrait. Size equals A0, well, we're specifying the um, native paper size for this document. But if you're, you know, if you're creating uh, a PDF document, just be aware that you'll be able to scale it up and shrink it down when you actually take it to the printer. Then I'm using the Warsaw theme, and in this case, in this this sample poster that we're building, I'm using the red and gray and black and white color scheme instead of the blue and gray and black and white that we're seeing in the slide presentation. That's just, just for a change. You can include a title and author and institution in your preamble, just like you do with your documents and with your slide presentations. And then finally, and it's important to remember this, the entire poster consists of one big frame environment that appears right after begin document. So one option for designing the layout of your poster is going to look something like this. Right at the beginning of that single frame, issue a make title command. Okay, we're not going to use title page like we do in our ordinary Beamer slide presentations. We're going to go back to using make title command like you would in an ordinary document and what that's going to do is it's going to take all of your front matter information your title author institution and so on and stretch it across the top of your poster you'll often want to create an abstract environment after that and then that abstract will also be rendered across the full width of your poster right under the title and author and other front matter information then you're going to divide the rest of your poster into columns. So this is a logical structural uh, feature that the Beamer poster package gives you. So you're going to use the columns environment and, and just create a, the, the entire columns environment using begin columns, T, and end columns. Inside of that environment, you start creating new columns. And you'll do that with begin column and end column. But you've got to, for each column, you've got to specify a width parameter. And I tend to like to do this using relative sizing. You'll often see if I'm building a landscape mode poster, I, I tend to go with a three column structure. I don't always do it, but, but I do. And so if I specify that my columns should have a width parameter of 0.32 times the line width, basically the overall text width that's going to fit in this, this, this poster itself, well, that, that's going to cause my, my columns to take up roughly a third of the overall width of the poster with a little bit of space left over for just gaps between them. So you can change that value to whatever you want. Just make sure that you've got enough room for everything that you're trying to cram into your poster. Within each column, you're going to want to create content blocks with the block environment. And so you'll do this by typing begin block, and then you need to specify the title that you want your block to have. This is going to appear along a little bar at the top of your, your content block. 
and then end your block with an end block statement. So it's, it's just an environment. Like we saw with ordinary Beamer presentations, you can add most LaTeX document elements inside of the blocks of your posters without really much modification. But there's going to still be some similar caveats in place. You're still going to want to avoid using floats. You can use labels and references for numbered items, but I'd advise against getting too complex. You should be prepared to resize your graphics and your tables to cause them to fit in the available space. And bibliographies are still a good idea. I tend to put them in a block of their own towards the end of the poster, you know, typically on the bottom right. And so we'll conclude this by going through a sample Beamer poster document. We'll see that our sample Beamer poster document follows the basic structure that we just laid out in the tutorial. It's also helpful, I think, to see, it's a scaled down version of it, but it's helpful to be able to see what the poster is going to look like as we're building it. So this is going to be a poster in a landscape mode, so it's wider than it is tall. This is the title, author, institute, and date, so it's all the front matter that gets rendered by make title. Here's the abstract that gets rendered by begin and end abstract. Three columns contained within a columns environment, but each column is contained within a column singular environment. And then within each column, these red areas with the bars along the top, those are examples of blocks. So the block title is what appears in the dark red bar. The content appears in the lighter red block. So let's see how we can put all of this together. We begin the document with document class as always, giving it the optional arguments of final and T, and then it's a, it's a Beamer class still. We've issued a mode presentation command in the preamble, use package of Beamer poster so that I can actually create a poster rather than an ordinary presentation. And this is exactly what we saw in the, the tutorial. I'm using landscape mode, A0 paper, scaling it up to 1.4, and um, that's it. Using the Warsaw theme with this red, gray, black color scheme. And then I load several packages. The Lipsum package is something you probably won't need, but it stands for Lorem Ipsum, and it's just a package that you can use to generate blocks of random text that uh, is just sample text to take up space. And you'll see that the text in my, my um, sample poster, if I blow it up for you, is just all nonsense because it's generated by this package. So you wouldn't really need this because you're going to put meaningful content in your posters if you ever make them. The graphic X package uh, is here because I, I've included a graphic. Listings because I'm going to put in some source code listings and then I have my settings for the listings package. Book tabs because I'm going to have a table. Color because of the source code listings. And that's it for the packages that I've loaded. Uh, there's going to be a bibliography, and I'm using the AMS Alpha bib style, or bibliography style. The front matter is a little bit more complicated on these posters, and I'll show you what I'm doing. So in the title, you'll see that there's a logo and a picture of me just because, um, you know, I, I, I want, a lot of times you'll see one or two logos on, on the top of a uh, title bar like this for a poster. There's really no need to be putting pictures of yourself. Um, it's just a picture that I happen to have hanging around on the computer that I, I, I made this with. So how do I do that? Well, it's all in the title, all in the text of the title, and that covers this. So you can see that the text of the title itself is just a sample LaTeX poster presentation using Beamer poster. So that's just this. Then I'm trying to get this MSRL logo spaced off to the left of that text and the picture of myself spaced off to the right. And I just do that by loading in uh, some include graphics uh, statements to the left and to the right of the title text. 
I specify a height of three centimeters because that seemed about right for that title frame, but I just experimented until I liked the way it looked. You might have different sizes that work better for you. Um, to get the spacing between the two, I used an example of something that's called a strut, and I'm not going to really get into that in much detail here, but what I did is that I, this is, this is an example of it here, this H space star with fill uh, supplied to its, its input. Basically, it, you can imagine it feeling kind of like you're putting a spring between this graphic and the title and causing it to expand out a certain degree. And then there's this opposing string, um, spring in between the title and the other graphic, causing everything to spread out. It's not exactly what's going on, but it's it's kind of an analogy for or, for how these things behave. You might not need to use any of that, but you know it's an example that you can you can take and hack and work with on your own. Then the rest of this acts more or less as normal. I've got an author and an institute and a date of today, so that'll get updated every time I compile the document, and that's what gives us this block of title and identifying information up here. Another thing that's um, worth remembering is um, these empty square brackets that I've supplied for title and author. Those are for alternate titles and alternate authors, often shortened versions. And if I had not put those there, where some of that information tends to appear is down here on this bottom bar of the poster. And I just didn't want any of that showing up, so I turned it off by supplying the empty square brackets to title and author. All right, so that, that, that's it for the complicated front matter information. We move on to begin document. Here's where we open the one and only frame that's in this poster presentation. We can see at the very end, that frame is closed right before in document. Back to the beginning. Okay. Very next thing that we see is make title and abstract. Now, you can see inside of the abstract, this is where I'm making use of that Lipsum package just to generate um, arbitrary text. We'll blow it up so you can see what that looks like. You wouldn't do it. This is where you would type your own meaningful abstract to describe your own research. Gives your audience a quick thing to read to see if they are interested in sticking around and asking you more questions about your poster. Once the abstract is done, we want to start organizing the remaining space of our poster into these, these logical column units. And so we can tell LaTeX that we want to start doing that by creating and then later on, the end of the document, ending the columns environment. Now, that's really just a placeholder where you can start populating it with columns. And we do that. Every time I want to create a column, I do so with a begin column and end column. And again, we've got to specify a width parameter for how much space that column ought to occupy horizontally. And I'm giving it just under a third of the line width, the overall width of the poster. All right. Well, once you've created a column and then ended it, in between the begin and end column statements, you can start filling your column with blocks. So you'll see that I've got several begin and end block statements. Each block has its own block title, introduction, historical perspective, methodology. Now, inside of the blocks for a real poster is where you'd want to have some content, often some explanatory text of your own. But again, out of laziness, I'm just using the Lipsum package to create some arbitrary text just to fill up the space. Well, that fills up about, a, you know, the first column is with as much, you know, text as available. So then we move on to the next column. So I've marked that as my middle column. I create it with the begin column and end column command. And in this one, I, I've given it uh, just a single block. Begin block with a title of results. And inside of this results column or this results block, you see that I've just got some examples of other LaTeX elements, other LaTeX document elements that we're used to using in the past. I've got some, uh, some text, I've got an equation, 
I've got a graphic that I've loaded with include graphics, and then I've got a table of, of data that I created with the tabular environment. And there's nothing really um, out of the ordinary happening with any of these, you know, text. The equation was created with the align environment. I've wrapped a center environment around the include graphics. I did scale it down to 90% of the line width. And nine, line width is a relative thing. It's the line width of the unit that we're currently working within, which is our, our column or our block. And so this graphic is taking up just 90% of the available width of this block. And finally, our table created with the tabular environment. Uh, I wrapped that inside of a center as well. And that's it. So there's nothing too out of the ordinary for these additional elements. I move on to the right column, the, th the, the final column of my, my poster. And it's again, taking just under a third of the overall width of the poster. And I'm putting in, using the listings package, just a transcript of some source code, some MATLAB source code. It's a function for doing LU factorization with partial pivoting. Wrapped it inside of a center statement. And that's really about all there is to that. It's the content of this block titled source code. There's one more block in the last column and it's a block for references. That's here. And all it has is a copy of the bibliography. Now, in order to get this particular bibliography or this set of selected references to fit in the remaining space that I had, I shrunk the font size, the bibliography down. I used the small font uh, and just wrapped that around the bibliography. That's not essential. I just wasn't going to have enough room for all of these references if I didn't do that. So your experience might be different on your own posters, but it just be aware that playing with that font size is a possibility. So that's that's really it for this particular poster. And it's just it's one example. If you do some web searching on the Beamer poster package, you'll find that there are a lot of templates that are available out there that you can experiment with. And so my recommendation is, is just to find one that looks close to what you would like yours to look like, and then get a copy of it and modify it until you have exactly what you want. This poster might be it, it, it might not, but I am going to make this source code for this poster available at the companion page for this tutorial at the Mathematical Science Research Launchpad. And with that, we're at the end of our tutorial on posters and slide presentations using the Beamer class. I hope you found some of this useful and that you'll be able to get started working on your own slide presentations and your own posters for presenting your research to others. Thanks for joining me and I hope that we'll see you again in future tutorials on other topics.